Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about tricks and tips for bipolar disorder from a natural medicine perspective. So, if you've watched our channel before, you, you realize that I look at things through a cellular and molecular perspective that's natural and based on holistic science. So, what is bipolar disorder? Bipolar disorder is mostly looked at as type 1 and type 2 under the DSM. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychological Disorders and Mental Health, and that's um, been a number of versions of it. We're in, we're in mostly, mostly the, we're using the fifth version right now. But there are uh, some big controversies over how this thing works, and I'll get into that in another video. But in any case, for us to understand what are the types that will be talked about by convention in the mental health world, Bipolar 1 and Bipolar 2 are what you're going to see and, and hear about. Bipolar 1 really deals with mostly a manic episode with maybe depressive episodes. So the emphasis in Bipolar 1 is on the manic side and not on the depressive side. Because bipolar really refers to this idea of, of vacillating between a, a high energy state and a low energy state in the brain. It means that the brain is expressing itself in a massive rush of voltage and the person is feeling um, just mania. They, they will go for days with being very energized. They could be hypersexualized. They could be gambling. They could be just very productive at work. They could be very fast or rapid talker. They could be someone who just doesn't sleep, and they might go for days. This is not something that lasts for hours. And it very often leads to hospitalization because the person is quite so manic that people notice that they're sweating and that they're, they're just frenetic in their activity. So the emphasis in bipolar 1 is on the manic side, and the depressive side may not show up much or it may be minimized. On the other hand, the bipolar 2 is where the emphasis is on the major depressive side, and you don't really ever get a full mania. Those, those folks tend to have hypomania, which means less than mania, so they might be energetic and excited in their phase of mania or, or hypomania for hours or for minutes and not usually days, and they're, not, they're never hospitalized the, for mania. So the idea of, of, of bipolar 2 has to do with a little bit of hypomania, not enough to be called mania, not enough to be, to be hospitalized, and, and the major depression is the emphasis on, on bipolar 2. The big danger with bipolar 2 diagnosis and treatment is that if the person is diagnosed as depressive and they're actually bipolar and they're treated with medications for depression and they've actually got major depression, which is their biggest symptom that lasts the longest time, but they're actually cycling between a bipolar phase of hypomania and, and major depression, their medications will make them just awfully messed up. So it's really important to get your diagnosis right and get your treatment right, especially if you're taking medications. Now, I'm not going to say that all medications are bad all the time because I don't believe that. I think that medications can be very useful and they can be very helpful for a select group of people for a short period of time. Um, most of the time, I don't, I don't think that we need long-term use of medication because we need to look at root causes. So let's look at root causes of what's going on. In a bipolar disorder, there seems to be this swing of energy between groups of cells and regions of cells that are firing. So in some cases, there are groups of cells that are overfiring and making a massive barrage of energy in the nervous system, in the brain. And that gives us the hypomania and mania, which are just different versions of the same kind of, of massive, massive energetic expression of self. And depression, on the other hand, is is just what it sounds like. There's reduced electrical activity, there's reduced chemical activity, there's reduced neurotransmitter activity. And today's world of drug therapy says that you have a chemical imbalance, and your chemical imbalance is that you essentially don't have enough neurotransmitters, so we got to give you a drug that will keep the neurotransmitters in the uh, synapse, in the gap between the cells, where one neuron communicates with another neuron through that gap called the synapse. And so that space, we introduce a drug called an SSRI, or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and those are drugs that re retain serotonin in the gap so that it hangs around longer and stimulates the post-synaptic neuron more. And so it, it kind of keeps it around and, and keeps it using, keeps it being used inside the synapse so that the, the presynaptic neuron that secreted the, 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 the serotonin doesn't suck it back in, which is what normally happens. Because normally we, we make these neurotransmitters, we release them, they travel across the gap, they grab a hold of the, of the postsynaptic side and dock with that, with that membrane, which is made of fat, 
and protein, and they stimulate that next, that next neuron in the line of neurons for firing. And so the, the approach with, with drugs is to, is to keep that serotonin hanging around longer if it's an SSRI class of drug. Now, this is not a lecture on drugs. This is a lecture on natural methods of how to, how to fix these mechanisms with natural means and how to understand root causes. But we have to understand the popularized and the hyper-used drugs because in the United States, we use these drugs much more than any other country. And I think it's a real problem that links us to some, some violence and other things that we have to really, really explore. So when we go back to that mechanism, you might wonder, well, gosh, do we have this, you know, these serotonin molecules, are they, are they very, very precious? Are they something that is, is very, very precious that the body makes and there's only a little bit of it like gold or palladium or something? And, uh, and the answer biochemically is fascinating in that we don't even store serotonin in vesicles at the ends of these, of these neurons. You might think that, gosh, if this was something really important and hard to make and difficult and we needed a drug to preserve it and keep it around because we just don't make enough of it, we would think that we would preserve it and hold it in the ends of the nerve ending, just like your gallbladder. You know, we secrete bile from our liver and our pancreas, and we store it in our gallbladder waiting as this precious juice, this green juice, to digest our fat when we suddenly have a meal. So our body knows this is a precious material and it stores it up and saves it for release. So you'd think logically, well, wouldn't the, the presynaptic neuron store serotonin and, and have it ready to go in case we need it? Turns out, no, we don't store any of it. We make it on demand because it's so cheap and so easy to make. And because we make it with elements like tryptophan, which is an amino acid, a protein, and with magnesium and with iron and with zinc and all these different minerals that are cofactors to make and, and produce and allow to dock these, um, these uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin on the postsynaptic neuron that receives the serotonin, that system requires that we understand not only that it's cheap to make serotonin and easy with sim simple nutrients, and that we need to have good receptor sensitivity. Now, receptor sensitivity is our next topic, and that's a big deal because receptor sensitivity has to do with how well is that, that lock ready to receive the key of serotonin. Serotonin inserts into it like a lock and key mechanism, and that lock and key mechanism has to be strong. It has to have cofactors of multiple minerals around because very rarely are receptors just a lock and a key. Usually a receptor is a, is a key and a bunch of other little keys around it that potentiate it and make it work. Make it work. And those are called cofactors or coenzymes, and those are mostly the trace minerals. So most receptors are not popularized as this, but they really are multiple minerals that need to be docked with them in addition to the neurotransmitter. It isn't just simple, serotonin docks in and it, and it works, or insulin docks into the receptor and it works. No, no, it's insulin requires salt and sodium and it requires other types of things, whereas serotonin requires iron and magnesium to be produced and to be docked and to be, and to be not just made, but to be docked in its receptor. So that idea is important to understand because chemicals in our environment can, can degrade the, the sensitivity of those receptors, just like we have insulin receptor sensitivity and insulin resistance changes that happen in the body. We also have serotonin receptor problems in the brain where, the, where the, the serotonin receptors and dopamine and norepinephrine, all of these receptors can become upregulated or downregulated. They're quite fluid. They're not fixed. So in the person, we can find that a person can have their receptors upregulated or downregulated in sensitivity, and we don't need to manipulate or change the net production of the actual amount of, of actual serotonin molecules or dopamine molecules or norepinephrine molecules that are produced. And that's very important to realize because during that manic phase of behavior, it's, it's presumed that during, during mania and hypomania, and even during schizophrenic episodes where people are, are very active, the, the prevailing theory has really been debunked, which is the idea that a person has tons of dopamine. They just make a ton of dopamine. And that happens in some cases, but very generally, it's not necessarily just a, a ton of dopamine being produced. It's dopamine receptor sensitivity problems. So please don't fall into the trap of oversimplification that says, oh, I just need to take a drug that either boosts norepinephrine or dopamine or serotonin or some combination of those SSRI or SNRI and all those other different drugs. And there's a whole other class of drugs for bipolar, which again, we won't get into. The real mechanism you want to understand is, how do I make the neurotransmitter? How do I have a healthy receptor for that neurotransmitter? And how do I metabolate, m metabolize the breakdown products of the neurotransmitter when it's done? Because when that molecule is used up and it's finished, we have to chemically degrade it. We have to break it down and dump it through our bloodstream. It has to come out of our brain, out of our blood-brain barrier, through our veins and, and lymph fluid, 
which is the glymphatic system of the brain. It has to make it into our veins. It has to go into our heart. It has to circulate through our kidneys and our liver and be detoxified. And it has to eventually come out in our bile or our urine. And so that's why one of our biggest assessments that we use to figure out what's going on with people is a urine organic acid test. Because this takes those chemicals from the original dopamine, serotonin, and epinephrine that were broken down in the brain and, and released and further uh, released from the kidneys and from, from into your urine, and we can, we can surmise and understand how much was originally in the brain. So that's the, the, the reason that we do these organic acid tests in urine to figure out what's going on with people's brain chemistry indirectly. Probably the second most important thing in, in uh, biochemical assessment of a person that has bipolar disorder or really any mental illness is hair analysis. Hair, hair metal analysis is extremely important to assess if a person has heavy metal toxicity that's chronic. Heavy metal toxicity may be chronic or it may be acute. We're, we're talking about chronic here, not acute. Chronic means that it's been there for longer than nine or 10 weeks. And acute is less than that because usually a blood test for heavy metals will show up after an acute um, toxic exposure in say a uh, workplace or an industrial exposure or a mining exposure, which is where most of these things occur. So if you're working in construction or mining or refining or, or you work with the tailings of drilling into, into metals and, and you do metal work, uh, if you're doing some kind of work like that where you get exposed to metals that you could breathe or that could be on your skin or that you could ingest, that kind of, of exposure is the main source of the acute exposure. The chronic exposure comes from our entire environment. It comes from our water. It comes from our, our food. It comes from our neighborhood. It comes from the Superfund sites that are local, locally around us that are full of toxic metals from other chemicals and other processes that are done by industry and that get dumped into the soil and into the into the water. So that's the source of some of those things. The next thing that we look at for bipolar chemistry understanding is we want to understand the, the B12 and the folic acid and the lithium because an individual that has problems with the methylation cycle that includes an intolerance of certain forms of B12 may find out through SNP testing, which is genetic testing, that they can't tolerate a certain kind of B12 like I've talked about before, the, the common methyl B12, which is a very powerful form of B12 and works great for most people. But as usual, there's 15 or 20% of us that don't do so well with that. And that would be a person that genetically would tolerate much better the hydroxy and adenosyl forms of B12, not the methyl form of B12. So that person might want to switch from one kind to another after they get a SNP test, or they might just experiment with it because it's very safe. And these are all oral forms of B12 that are taken as, uh, as lozenges or as, as liquid drops uh, or little tiny tabs that a person would dissolve in their mouth to absorb through their gums. Further, and perhaps the most important about this, is that B12 requires lithium. B12 requires lithium in order to, to operate in the brain and make the brain work normally with regard to serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine, which are the neurotransmitters in question in most of our mental illnesses that we look at. So lithium orotate is a natural form of lithium that's very safe to take, and it's uh, available over the counter at health food stores. It's extremely safe. It's usually sold in about five milligram little tablets. You can break them very easily with your fingers. You can break them into smaller sections, and you can take smaller amounts. But lithium orotate is super safe. It does not lead to the same kind of tardive dyskinesia that lithium prescribed leads to when, when you get a prescribed lithium from, from a, a medical doctor or a prescriber or a psychiatrist or a mental health nurse there is a great danger to lithium toxicity and other drugs that can cause tardive dyskinesia. And tardive dyskinesia is caused by drugs. It is a, it is a, a basal ganglia disorder where the individual reacts to the drug and they get lip movements and leg movements mostly, and sometimes dance-like movements of their bodies. So they'll, they'll go through this kind of choreiform or dance-like movement where their body will writhe around and their lips will move and, and, and really just excessively move. And again, I'm not mocking people. I need to demonstrate this for you because it will look like um, lip movements and spontaneous lip movements. They will also have leg movements. Their legs will jiggle and dance and move. This is not necessarily the same thing as restless leg syndrome. That's another problem. This happens when you're awake, when you're seated, and you just can't sit still. And it can come in waves. So if you can look back on this, this discussion so far, you can see that we're talking about a whole lot of things that make the brain vastly swing from overactive to underactive, and that's very much a root cause problem that is metabolic. So we really need to understand the individual's metabolism 
and know that it's possible for a number of people to have the same problem like insulin resistance or heavy metal toxicity and because of genetic variation have different illnesses. So if I took 15 people and they all had the same problem at their core, which was insulin resistance and heavy metal toxicity, just for example, some of them might have bipolar and not depression only, and some of them might have depression but not the bipolar features, some of them might have anxiety, and some of them might have no depression and not really bipolar swings. Others of them might have an eating disorder and no depression or anxiety to speak of. So you have to realize that individuals are going to have the same root causes of chemical imbalance that lead to genetic expressions that are different for each person, but its root cause is often very similar, which is why a lot of times you'll see natural doctors like me tell you the same treatment for everything, which is clean up your bad toxins, get rid of them, give yourself lower carbs, give yourself better insulin resistance and, and less insulin resistance, give yourself more minerals, give yourself better quality proteins, give yourself more omega-3 fats. You're going to hear that mantra going on over and over and over again because the, the root cause of disease is the same stuff. Now, there are subtle differences for each illness that are specific to that illness, and, and that sometimes requires a specialist. But generally, you can do a lot of this yourself, and I want to give you hope that you can, you can do things. Uh, the, the next topic is the folic acid component. There's a, there's a, a B vitamin called folic acid or, or, or folates, and some people tolerate them very well. In fact, we need them to prevent neural tube defects in pregnant women so that babies aren't born with spina bifida, which is a non-union of the spine at the back, somewhere in the neck or, or usually the low back. And, and so we give people folic acid and we fortify orange juice with folic acid in the United States to make sure that we get enough folic acid into our pregnant women for, for proper uh, formation of the neural tube. Now, there are a group of people that don't do very well with folic acid mentally. They don't tolerate it very well. And so they need a 5-methyl form of folic acid, 5-methylfolate. And very often, if they are one of those sensitive people, they need a very low dose of this. Now, the typical dosing of this is about 400 to 800 micrograms, micrograms per day. But a person that's very sensitive might take 5-methylfolate at a much, much lesser amount. And they might have to take lithium for a while, lithium orotate for a while, before they even take their B12 and before they even take their folic acid. So you're, you're going to find that, that the order of operations is often lithium orotate first, then the correct form of B12, a hydroxy B12 or adenosyl B12 in small amounts, and then vanishingly small amounts of 5-methylfolate. And the big problem, too, is they've got to go through their entire cupboard and remove uh, some of those people, all of the methyl B12 and all of the regular folic acid. So we also have to look at the, the ideas that a patient, a, a person with bipolar might have problems with omega-3s. When you have an omega-3 deficiency, you're going to have a dominance of omega-6, and that can create some very strange problems in the brain that are easily fixed by giving EPA and DHA, which are the building blocks of the brain. And the most important thing in this case is EPA, which is eicosapentaenoic acid. This is a fat that comes from largely fish, but you'll also find it in grass-fed animals when the grass is very, very healthy and the animals are very, very healthy, you'll find these omega-3s. But your liver only converts a little bit of this, this omega-3 fat into EPA and DHA, about 5% in many people. So you want to look for labels that actually have the amount listed on the label of EPA and DHA. You don't want to just take omega-3, 1,500 milligrams, for example, and ignore how much is actually preformed uh, EPA and DHA. You want to get, in most of my cases with my patients, I'm looking for three to 500 uh, milligrams of EPA and or DHA in one capsule so that they're not taking big bulky lots of big bulky fish oil capsules all day long although you have to sometimes and it, and it really does work it, it's great for your skin it's great for your reproductive organs it's great for women with with menstrual problems it's fantastic for the brain and it's very important to recover brains that are having signaling problems because EPA is that signaling molecule the last point here is to look at QEG and neurofeedback. I think it's very important to have a QEG map done of the brain, and, and neurofeedback can be extremely helpful for some people, and it can help identify what people might be fragile, because a number of people will show up on the QEG as having quite a fragile brain electrically, and that will guide us to be much more gentle in our, our talk therapy, as well as our rehab, as well as our neurofeedback, until we can strengthen them with nutrition. And the really cool thing is, after you've strengthened their brain with nutrition, the QEG will change, and you'll see changes on the QEG brainwaves that'll show this person's brain may be stronger and more resilient and less volatile and have less wave changes that are more fragile. So um, 
we need to talk about Bacopa monnieri, which is one of my favorite herbs. Bacopa monnieri is used as a tincture. It's also used as a powder. You can have freeze-dried in, in capsules. And Bacopa monnieri has been used to normalize the uh, neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and, and norepinephrine, as well as the receptors for the sensitivity of those neurotransmitters. So I like Bacopa monnieri. It's very safe. It's available over the counter. It's a simple herb that can be used. And it should be, um, as, as always, anything that you're doing when you're prescribed a drug, you should be talking to your prescriber about that particular material. So I hope you've liked this. The idea of some, some real a quick, quick but deep dive into, into bipolar disorder and some of the chemistries and electricities behind it.